All right, we are live. Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and I know you have missed us in the past three hours since we've been on air. Like I said, I should no longer be in charge of my own calendar. I want to say yes to everybody. I want to speak to them right away. I end up jamming my week with eight or nine shows, and then I have to say, holy shit, I have to do my day job. I got to scale this back. So we're doing two shows today. Clearly, there'll be individual episodes. They're going to be on YouTube next week. So if you missed our earlier episode or if you're going to miss any part of this episode, you can check it out next week at the end of the week on YouTube. And then, of course, you can find that on Apple or Spotify or any of your other podcast platforms that you listen to. Before we get into today's episode, we're brought to you by Contempo Specialty Packaging. Listen, you know how I feel about the packaging in the industry. It's not good. It can get better. I think we can get more environmentally friendly. I think we can get more sustainable. I think we can make stuff that people just generally want to keep because why not? That's always fun in this industry. And that is where Contempo Specialty Packaging comes in. They are finally making offerings out of 100% hemp. As you can see, the exterior box for these eighth jars are very nice, very sustainable, right? They've got beautiful eighth jars. It's another one of their offerings. They've got so much more. They come from 40 years of packaging background, servicing the top brands in the world of fascist fashion and over four years of cannabis packaging experience. They work with many of the largest operators in the cannabis industry and their 100% hemp offering. This one is just one of many. As I showed you, we've got beautiful eighth jars. I love this jar. I really do. We've got some that are a little bit more muted if that's the way your brand looks. We've got cool tins for edibles that you can see are child proof and squeeze open. You know me, I love the joint case. I'm a big fan of pre-roll packs. This is something that I'm going to use personally, just kind of keep everything in there as well. And then for those of you that put it out in Mylar bags, we got you covered too. So if you're looking for beautiful child resistant packaging made from 100% hemp or any of their other great offerings for your cannabis products, check out contempopackaging.com. That is contempopackaging.com, C-O-N-T-E-M-P-O packaging.com and let them know that C-Lab sent you. All right, folks, this is... Today's conversation is a good example of, or today's conversation will be a good example. We are not one of those podcasts that records an intro and then replace a recorded version of the guest conversation. So I don't know if it's going to be good or not. He's a lot smarter than me. So let's see if I can, uh, you know, keep up with him. But this is an example of why I started this podcast. So my first job in this industry was with a group that did events um, focused on helping companies raise capital. And I've told the story a bunch of times. We don't need to get into it. But one of the gentlemen that I came across was always very kind to me, um, was interested in the events. We never ended up working together. But it, it's it's cool because we've come full circle. I can recall a few of our conversations. And, we, you know, I'd always kind of talk about the industry in general because I was very, very, you know, interested in it. And. If I remember correctly, I think, you know, he, the, the person that I'm going to interview today, clearly they knew what they were talking about and the company that he, he founded could speak for that. But it just shows you that conversations like that are the reason I started this show, because I was meeting great people in the industry. They're very friendly. They're very knowledgeable. And I thought that people that I knew outside of the cannabis space should hear these conversations and i believe that they can benefit from these conversations and it's something that i actually heard in an interview that he gave earlier he didn't give it earlier today i listened to it earlier today but there is still a huge stigma around this industry and people think that we just sit around and smoke pot all day no we just do it for eight hours a day. i'm kidding but you know it, it, it is a very professional industry and this one is just as hard if not harder than most industries out there because of the significant regulations unless you're using Simplifya. <laughs> See how I did there? So please welcome the founder and CEO, Marian Mariathison of Simplifya. Marian, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for having me here. It's nice to see you again. It is great to see you, man. No, I am, um, you know, as part of what I do for this show is I, I try to listen to as many interviews as I can. I read the articles that you can, which I'm out of Forbes and Wall Street Journal subscriptions. If anybody wants to donate to us, I can't get the free articles anymore. But I heard you say that. And I know, you know, on this show, we've done a very good job of kind of putting that stigma aside. But the the outside world, I mean, there's not a person when you talk to them the first time that doesn't make that joke. I think your company and what you guys are doing is a great example of the opposite of that. Well, you know, simplify the joke even internally is that the cannabis industry is so exciting and fun and we're kind of like the, the boring 
uh, group that sits behind, you know, the scenes to ensure that uh, compliance, right, in a highly regulated industry, it happens in a in a very effective and methodical way. And and you're right, you know, even when I first got into this space, my own father, because I used to own a tequila company, was like, "Hey, what's with you and vices? You started off in tech, then you're in tequila, now you're in cannabis, right?" And uh, we had a nice chuckle about that. But I, I think the the good news really taught is that you know, the stigma is starting to kind of, I guess, wean off or it's starting to go away, but um, it's still out there. And, but I'm, I'm, you know, I've been in this industry now in one form or the other for at least over six years and really excited that I stuck with it. And, and you know, I'm really proud of what, you know, the industry is doing and where it's headed. You know, you make the joke that that simplifies the, we'll call it the adult in the room in the cannabis industry, but with, with that, being compliant and making sure that that everybody is compliant or that most of us are is, is the glue that holds the industry together and that's what allows us to advance you know i remember specifically when the pandemic started and and cannabis was deemed essential i i wish i was one of those people that would go back to my old episodes and talk about the things that i called right but i said i go this is an opportunity for cannabis companies to show the world what they do and as long as they do it the right way and they stay within the regulations that have been put on them I think we're going to come out the other side of this much stronger, better, and, and clearly that that has happened, right? We have seen what this industry yeah. has done while everybody else's doors were shut down and, and everyone kind of came out of their shell and said, listen, we're locked. I'm, I'm, I'm using cannabis. Like this is, this is scary. I'm anxious. This, this helps yeah. me more, you know? So, um, you know, with that being said, you guys are really the glue that holds the industry together. And, and you were kind of the inception of Simplifya happened if i recall at kind of the the origin of the cannabis space that you you that simplify was born out of a partnership with a law firm and i imagine they were looking for a way to grow and scale the and i won't say little amount of cannabis knowledge they had in house i will say it at the time the little amount of cannabis knowledge they had in house because just not a lot of people had it right so to get more people educated on everything else i'm sure there was a way to grow and scale so kind of talk to us about the inception of simplify it and then because i go in no order whatsoever i want to get into your background after that yeah so you know i have a lot of respect um for the law firm vicente cedarberg and the three partners brian and christian and josh or dear friends of mine i think they were true pioneers in that, you know, they were, you know, they were instrumental with Amendment 64. Steve Fox, who's also another friend, you know, God rest his soul, he passed away recently. But these guys really pioneered the the way to for legalization. And in Amendment 64 was what it was for Colorado, right? And I think they were really they had the foresight in seeing that, you know, cannabis was not just going to be a Colorado or California or Washington movement. It was going to be a national movement, movement eventually, and then a global movement. And, um, you know, that's kind of how Simplify came about. They were like, hey, we're, we've got all this business trying to keep all these licensed operators compliant, but we need something that's more scalable, you know, on a global scale, but also that's going to be something that's cost effective because, you know, when you're hiring lawyers to come in and do yeah. compliance audits for you, it gets... No, quite pricey. And so, you know, you know, hats off to those guys because you know they were really the true uh, you know, visionaries behind Simplify. And then I happened to be that entrepreneur that, you know, had started and sold tech companies. And so I joined forces with them and here we are, you know, coming up on five years now, Simplify has been around. Very cool, man. And, and it is very needed, right? You know, I come from the, the tech world myself and enterprise software. And the whole point of what we do for a living there is to, to automate things and make it easier on people, make, sure. you know, simplified processes, give them the ability to scale. So looking at your background, being both a tech entrepreneur and then having a tequila company, which, you know, I'm now understanding how highly regulated alcohol is. Funny enough, it, it's a comedian, Brendan Schaub. He's coming out with his own liquor company. He's talking about it on his podcast that if you were to, you know, produce a spirit in Jacksonville, Florida, and you wanted to sell it up, oh, my camera's frozen. Give me a second. Let me come back there. So if you wanted, you produced a spirit in Jacksonville, Florida, and then you wanted to sell it at a bar across the border in Georgia, that happens to be, you know, maybe 10 or 15 miles away, there's still like four agencies that you have to go through to get your product 20 miles down the street, just because it happens to be in a different state. So, you know, I, I look at your background, 
right place, right time for Simplify, but someone you, you knew the tech side of it, you knew the development side of it. I feel like you've been familiar with that. And then all of a sudden now you're in a highly regulated industry with, with alcohol and you see all the nuances and everything else. I feel like at some point you probably leverage your tech background to help you with that. You know, was that really why you were the perfect person to be in that spot at that time to start Simplify? Uh, you know, hard, hard to say, Todd. I think, you know, it was just stars kind of aligning, I suppose, right? Because I did know the guys at VS and, you know, they're super smart lawyers, but they were trying to figure out how do you productize it? How do you create a SaaS model out of that? And I think that's where my background really came uh, into play. And, you know, as you know, a lot of it has to do with chemistry and, and trust and respect. And I think it was a lot of that mutual on both sides. And so, you know, when we started talking about it, it just all of a sudden clicked, at least in my head, because those guys had lived in cannabis for quite some time. And I was like, I think, you know, if we really can create a product that helps streamline and create efficiencies and all those, you know, cheesy words that, you know, we come up with for technology and SaaS companies, I felt like we had something. And so, you know, we were, again, very lucky in that, you know, they had a very good reputation. So in Simplify, even when we started building the product and we would reach out to licensed operators to ask questions like, where are your pain points? You know, what would you like to see in, in a product like this? And people were very, very open. As you know, the cannabis industry, very friendly people. And you know, they started sharing all the things that you know they would like to see to help their lives and their businesses be easier. And <laughs> through all that knowledge, we we built this product. I, I can only imagine when you went to cannabis operators and asked them what their pain points were. They're like, <laughs> I don't have the time to sit down. I don't have that kind of time to sit down and share it with you. But you know, at, at, at the time and even now, that that is the component that's needed because not everybody does have the ability to hire, especially early on an expensive lawyer or, you know, continue to have a lawyer on staff for every little thing. Now, obviously for the big things, you want to make sure that you're going to somebody, but what you guys have done, you know, from what I can tell is take a lot of the, the questions, like just the, is it plugged in type questions and break them down into a yes and no. And somebody can use, okay, we're doing things right. Um, yeah. You know, so you, you founded the company, if I recall correctly, in Colorado. Was that the first market that you guys dedicated yourself to? And you just kind of figured out, hey, we're going to start this product and we're going to do it specifically for Colorado. Yeah. So, you know, we always had ambitions to go outside of Colorado, even when we started here. So, you know, we uh, started Colorado, but we were already you know, looking and working inside California and Washington as well. But Colorado was very easy because, you know, it was right, you know, our back, our you know, backyard, right? And so um, that's where we started the conversations. That's where we started beta testing with some of our clients. Um, and, you know, one of the things we told people early on, the ones that were like, hey, we're too busy to really help you with this and give you feedback. I, we and I view your license as the most valuable asset if you're in the, in the industry, right? If yeah. And so what we said was, look, we'll help you maintain that license. Um, and if you can just help us get some data points around what you need. And again, you know, we were very fortunate in that a lot of these people were so open and gave their time willingly. And we had you know, a handful of kind of beta or pilot customers that, um, you know, really made Simplify what it is today. Interesting. So when you go to create this software, and one of the things I really love that you said about it, because, you know, coming from the software world, I noticed when we came to cannabis, there was a lot of traditional software companies that wouldn't work with this industry. They, they, I don't know if it's, you know, because of the federal regulations, because of their own morals or values or anything else, but I was actually shocked because I tried doing kind of a technology resale play, um, you know, like a, a, a crap, I forget the channel partner or anything else along those lines in this space. And a lot of the companies I thought would be a no brainer that I had very good relationship with this flat out said no, or the salesperson that I knew said yes. And then, you know, from management, it came down and said no. So yeah. I thought luckily and unluckily, because it takes time, the software that's going to be created for this industry is going to be specifically designed from this industry, which is great long term, instead of 
taking a piece of software that's designed for something else and kind of adjusting it. You yeah. had talked about how the uh, POS and loyalty programs, great as they are, they can kind of take the skeleton from another industry, slap on a couple different exterior parts, and it works for cannabis, right? Whereas I'm sure you looked, and I'm curious to know, did you go out and look to see if there was something that you could take as a foundation and build off of, or did you just say, hey, if we're going to do this, let's do it right and start from scratch? That's a great question, Todd. And, and so we we did kind of scour around to see if there was you know something out there on the shelf that we can at least build on top of. But we ultimately what we realized was that it was cannabis was so different, right? Even if you looked at other compliance products, um, and really we even to this day we've been approached by these highly regulated industries wanting to white label simplifies product, uh, for example, for even oil and gas, believe it or not. Wow. And so we were very surprised to find that there weren't much to build off of. So what we realized was the best way forward was if we were able to custom build it from ground up, knowing all the, you know, the different areas that we need to cover, that way you don't have to go do all this heavy customization and rely on some third-party company and what they had built. So you know, we were very lucky and um, I was a founder of a software dev shop called Salon Solutions. I found it about 15 years ago. Um, so went to that group, super smart group, and said, look, here's, here's kind of the, you know, the overlay or the prototype that we want to build. And they started you know, building it with all this input from all these operators. And you know, we've, we've come a long way. And uh, you know, because we, as you probably know, Todd, we started off servicing only the license operator, but now we have products for the insurance industry. Um, we're about to get into the financial institution side because we have products for banks and we're about to announce hopefully our first uh, government uh, client, you know, where the enforcement officers will be using um, our product to go and enforce. So come a long way. Very cool, man. No, and that, and that seems like a great natural progression because you know, it starts with the, the, the plant touching companies themselves, but even other companies that are ancillary businesses or, you know, traditional businesses that have a stake in, in, in longstanding industries. When you do business with the cannabis industry, there is a lot of compliance that you have to consider in yourself. Um, and then you, once you start doing business in cannabis and it becomes known that you do business in cannabis, you start taking a lot of the risks that the cannabis businesses themselves take. I know, and I'm sure you went through a lot of this early on as well too, but I told you about Cannabis Dealmaker Summit, the event thing that I did. We, you know, our, our CEOs sent, a, um, sent an email to the bank and they saw the CDS logo and we got an email back that said, you have 30 days to find another bank, right? We, we were an event company, right? We didn't touch, yeah. we were so far yeah. removed from the plant. We didn't make money off the plant. We weren't getting paid by a plant touching company. Yeah. It was investors that were giving us, you know, money to attend. We were purely an events company and we lost our bank. You know, I know other companies yeah. lose payment processors and everything else. So I imagine, you know, leveraging a, a technology such as yours kind of takes a lot of the risk out of some of these things here. Yeah, and you know, this part of the reason, uh, you know, for example, uh, Hub International, right? Big insurance group. I mean, they're already risk averse, and that's part of the reason when they, you know, came to us and you know we monitor licenses for them. Uh, same thing with uh, you know financial institutions. It's there's so much compliance that it's almost daunting, right? So which is why we feel the pain of the license operator. It's like you have state regs, you have local regs, and now when federal legalization comes, you're probably going to have federal regs on top of that. Right? And so how do you stay on top of all that? It's, uh, you know, a lot of these big MSO clients of ours have big compliance departments. And even then, you know, when you're a multi-state operator, how do you stay on top of the ever-changing regs and all that goes along with it? And so we, we feel like, you know, we're very proud that we've created a product that helps move the industry forward. And, you know, now we're helping do that not just for the license operator, but for other kind of ancillary services that are a necessity for this industry, right? And, um, and so, you know, we're jumping into payments now, we're getting into commerce and loyalty. So, you know, we've really found our footing, I feel like in the industry. And so very excited, Todd. 
I, I want to circle back to the things that you just mentioned, the, the the payments specifically. But one of the things that really stood out to me when I was going through your website and some of the interviews that you did is that a huge issue in the cannabis space is is document storage. Now, coming from an IT background, it is probably one of the most boring things that you can talk about. But it's it's crazy to understand massive companies or, or even just, you know, three, 400 user companies and not having a proper file structure and retention policies and different accesses to different files. I know I, I worked with that through the, the Microsoft Office 365 platform, but it's funny to me when I think about it and I apply it to the cannabis industry traditionally before it was fully legal, it was an industry where you did not document storage. You didn't store anything. You wanted no paper trail whatsoever. So, you know, I imagine when the when it comes into the, the legal market that that's a hard habit for for people to break you go into a grow a lot of the information is on a whiteboard that can easily be erased there's a lot of handwritten papers and things like that so you know tell me why is document storage such an issue in this space is it just because you know people come from an agriculture or a cannabis background it's something they're not used to is it is it the the black market origin just curious to know because it seems like a pretty simple solution for people to solve but it's not well you know i think it could be uh, a multitude of those things you listed off Todd. because I, I think you know one i think unless you're a very organized person you know you people in general just don't have a very good habit of how they keep even their personal information organized, right? And, and I think cannabis coming from the, you know, the depths of kind of this behind the scenes kind of uh, area, I think they they were so used to making sure that they were getting rid of paper trail, right? Anything that might get them in trouble down the road, but all of a sudden, you know, this industry becomes legal and it becomes legitimized and everyone's like, okay, now what do I need to be doing to ensure that I'm staying, you know, on top of all the things I should be doing, right? Because compliance is really one of the key elements of compliance is, is uh, historical records. And so, you know, when an enforcement officer walks in, whether it's a marijuana enforcement division or not, and they say, okay, where's your historical information? Where's your license information? What have you been doing to stay compliant? And if you're rummaging around in a file folder trying to find all this, all this old information, you're not going to look very organized. And it's probably not going to come off very well to that person standing there looking for this information, right? So I think like that's part of the reason we created this document storage or digital one within Simplify's core product is that you know you can keep all your applications, license information, uh, you know previous audits, all these things that really are going to matter not only for if an auditor walks in but for m a type of uh, situations on the road or at any point if anyone wants to see are you doing everything that you should be doing yes i am you, know, you open up simplify or whatever it is that you're using and say and so here you go here's everything that you need right and so it, it's uh i think historically to you to what I was saying, I think people are just not very organized when it comes to things. Not everyone, but people that are not. But then when it comes to an industry like this, they're just not very good with paper trail stuff because they're trying to hide it, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, that definitely seems to be the, the you know, to me, what could have been the, the core problem. But, you know, for me, your service kind of allows these companies and you mention it through whether it's not just an audit, but if, if somebody, if there's an M and a opportunity, right. Um, yeah. to be able to take a look, if even just raising capital, if you want investors to go in Absolutely. and take a look at your business, being able to present it to them and you're right, you know, yeah. compliance, a lot of it is like when you were in high school or middle school and you had to do math problems. And, you know, some of us did them in our head and we wrote the answer and the teacher was always like, well, it's wrong. Cause you didn't show your work. Right. It, <laughs> compliance is just showing your work. So I know I'm bad at it. And if you know what I see what you guys are doing, and if you're familiar with the old TV show, The Odd Couple, you're turning a bunch of Oscars into Felixes. <laughs> right, right. But as you said, no, it, it, I think it's really why we exist, for, at least for a licensed operator, is just to make their lives easier, right? It's just like, you know, here we have the audit tool, we have the, the document management, we have uh, standard operating procedures. All of these things are designed specifically to ensure that they're staying compliant, but also just make it easy on them. Whether you have a big compliance team or if you're just a you know small mom and pop with 
you know, one person who's the manager and the, and the compliance person. Really, so that's what it's for. You guys have come a long way, you know, with your product set and expanding different offerings. We just talked about the different offerings that you have for insurance companies and now, you know, government officials. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, when you look at your business and as someone who has experience in tech, where do you how do you start making those decisions where it's like, okay, our core module is at a place where we can start adding ancillary modules onto it. Um, you know, how do you kind of balance that decision to continue to do what you know and do extremely well versus trying to be everything to everyone. Now, obviously being everything to everyone is, is almost impossible, but you can be a lot to an individual, especially if they trust you with your core product. So as you progress over the years and in this industry, I feel like we've had to move faster than most because it's moving so quickly because everyone loves it. You know, how do you balance that? and make sure that the the core modules or the newer modules are in a place where you, I don't want to say are justified to bring out another module, but where it's like, oh, they're bringing out something else. Well, this one's still full of bugs or it doesn't work or anything else. So <laughs> right. how, do you, how do you balance that? Or is that just coming from your experience in tech in general? Well, no, I, I think, you know, it, it's always, it's always work in progress, Todd. Um, you know, for us, if you look at even the new areas that we're getting into or the new type of client sets or the new products that we're, uh, venturing into, it's still around our core competency as to what Simplify does, right? I mean, we've now ingested over, I don't even know, like most recent number of 12 million words of regulations and it's constantly growing. Our, our you know, product code base is constantly growing. And so, um, you know, you have to get to a point where you're very comfortable with the product and, and our process and procedures internally. And a lot of this, us venturing into these new areas is driven by demand. You know, we weren't planning to get into the insurance side or the banking side or the government side, but when the opportunity came around, we were like, okay, we're not veering away from our core competency. We're staying within the realm or the bounds of what we already do. We're just now tweaking the products, adding some new features, uh, you know, some new ways of using the product for a different type of user base, right? And so, that was a very easy thing to kind of take on because again, we we're staying very true to our nature of a compliance company. And so uh, we we're very lucky because you do get pulled in different directions. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we had companies that were outside the cannabis industry saying, hey, we'll, can we white label your product? We'll pay X amount of dollars. And it's very easy to go after these shiny objects, but we you know, decided not to do that, at least at that point. We might revisit it down the road, but I think some of the experience that you bring from the tech area does kind of help because, you know, if you're a first time entrepreneur, which I've made this mistake plenty of times when I started, you know, 18 years ago is I would chase after every shiny ob object that came towards me for that company. Right. And, and you learn very quickly. You can't do it all. Yeah. It, it's so attractive too, especially like, you know, when, when you're in the beginning of the journey and, and you're struggling and it's not where you want it to be, where you're like, oh, here's another opportunity that could be extra yes. money for us. And maybe it can fund what we're doing. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I, I booked eight shows this week just because I have such a hard time saying no to people. But, you know, and then I look and I'm like, Ugh, I can't do my normal job because I can do eight freaking episodes of a podcast, which I love to do. But I think that's the hardest part for anybody at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey is to learn how to say no and be okay with yes. it and focus on what you're doing. And I think that's, you know, I think you guys have done that correctly. Clearly you've seen success. Um, you know, you just had the, the, I know you just recently raised your series B at $6 million. So congratulations on that. You Thanks, know, man. as you grow into this larger, more powerful mainstay in the cannabis industry, I'm curious to know at what point do you start weighing your options when you expand to extend by by continuing to develop, you know, modules and, and different software versus acquisition, right? Because as I, I understand it, and I'm not a genius here, but a lot of the larger com tech companies these days, they'll almost have like a VC unit within their organization to invest in a few companies I want to keep their eye on, and then they'll acquire them to bring them on when it complements the technology or in the more sinister way because they don't want to compete with them, um, you know? As, this is where I'm curious. I'm really curious in the tech world, you know, at what point do you start looking like, hey, we can develop that or we should talk to these guys because they're doing it well. And maybe we can bring them under our umbrella. Yeah, so it's, it's a great, interesting point you bring up because, you know, just over the last few years, we've actually looked at a few different companies that 
we wanted to acquire. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, obviously, as you know, Todd, that goes behind that, right? I mean, the deal terms itself, the valuation, is there a cultural fit between the teams and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, we, we have not done an acquisition as of yet. You know, we, even as recent as a few months ago, there was a company I really liked and um, we weren't able to get to terms. But one of the key elements that I think that we have is we have an extremely strong management team and, um, and, and the entire team itself. So when we really feel like there's a new product or an area of, of core competency that we want to focus on, we'll either bring someone in, uh, hire someone, or within our team, we have usually someone there. We've got a little over 50 people now uh, that can really kind of lead that charge. For example, uh, you know, when we decided we wanted to really make, a, make some headway into the financial institutions or the banking side, you know, we brought on Katrina, uh, you know, who's our GC, but also our chief banking officer, because she is probably second to none when it comes to her knowledge around compliance, as well as banking. And um, so that's kind of how we, you know, we take it, you know, case by case. Um, you know, we ourselves have been approached about 11 times now. Uh, to get acquired and you know, we're staying the course of what we're doing uh, at the moment. But yeah, it's, it's fun and exciting, you know, especially when you see uh, really innovative companies that are doing kind of cutting edge stuff. But uh, fortunately for us, we, if we can't acquire, we can usually you know, build it within our, within our team. Very cool, man. I feel like, you know, me personally, and maybe my journey will change. I'd have too much of an ego to be like, no, we can build it ourselves. I know we can, but there, there's always a time and a place. Um, you talk about, so, so recently, and I think it was in April, maybe a little earlier, you guys announced, you know, the payments system that you have. I'm really curious to learn more about that because I think that's one of the white whales in the industry. We have a lot of different solutions, some good, I, I, I hope nobody takes offense. I haven't seen any that I would say are great yet. Um, yeah. You know, there's still a struggle and it's a struggle because of the laws of this country. I'd love to hear more about what you guys are doing from payments, because again, from someone whose full sole focus is compliance, I feel like you've got a little bit of insight how to do it right. Thanks, man. I, I think, uh, you know, we're very lucky and, you know, payments is completely outside of my real house. Um, but Fortunately for us, there's a gentleman by the name of Jeff Katz, who's been a friend of mine for about 10 years. Uh, he was the founder of Mercury Payment Systems, which is now uh, WorldPay. Uh, probably one of the most knowledgeable guys around payments, but also around commerce and POS. And so, you know, we struck up a conversation, gosh, almost a year ago now, um, where he, you know, was like, I'm excited about what you're doing with Simplifya. And he's like, I want to do payments again and let's talk about this, right? And so Simplify as a company that's known now for compliance, one of my key elements, as I told Jeff was, look, you know, payments and commerce and POS and all this stuff, but if we're gonna, you know, do this together, compliance has to be the forefront of what we do. Yeah. And to obviously, you know, usability and um, features and all that stuff. And so I'm really excited, it's called Tender. Tender comes out, actually, we have a soft launch here, uh, first uh, part of September, and um, with a POS that we'll have to announce, I can't say who it is just yet, but we've got some that are lined up, and the first one, uh, we're done with integration, I think some few tweaks and things that are being, uh, that are happening at the moment, uh, Todd, but um, only reason we got into payments was because of a guy like Jeff, because Again, when I, was, when I was talking about core competency, we're a compliance company. We're not a payments or commerce or loyalty company, but a guy like that just brings a lot of credibility and a lot of ex exper expertise. And we saw that uh, if we can do something in payments to make it really be the shining star in the industry and do it compliantly, then yeah. we have something and that's what we're shooting for. I think that needs to happen. I mean, we're regulated down here to, to can pay down here in Florida and yeah. it's a good system, but it, it's yeah. not, you know, it's not the best. Um, it's definitely not like using my debit card or, or you can't use a credit yeah. card with it. 
but you know it's it's what we have florida has a ton of other problems in its own right but it's great to see someone who has a compliance mind coming to payments because i feel like that's where a lot of things can blow up for companies um you know on the money exchange and everything else so yeah you know where's you know i can't wait for you to see it todd honestly and, and for the industry to see it because from a, a usability level from a cyber level to compliant level it's it's uh you know Obviously, I'm a little biased, but I like to think it's it's uh, pretty cool. And so, uh, I guess time will tell whether we think we've got that solution for this. I'm excited. I'm all for new solutions, and I'm all for competing solutions. I mean, the free market is what makes a lot of what we do great, and you yes. know, competition is what drives it. There, that's the problem with the Florida market is we have 20 companies, and they have no freaking yes. competition. Um, that's why I yeah. listen. I love our Florida companies, but. You know, they, they don't have many people knocking on their door trying to take their business so they get to rest on their laurels. Um, I'll take that opinion so nobody else here gets in trouble for saying that. Um, <laughs> you, you know, where you sit in the industry, being in so many places, I think you, you said you're international as well, too. You get to see a lot of different compliance models or regulatory models for cannabis across different markets and I guess different, you know, countries now. Without trying to offend anybody, do you see anybody who is doing it better than others? Is there a market that, you know, if you were a politician that you would point to and say, hey, when we go to write the laws of federal legalization, we believe that this state is doing it the best and we should model our laws off of what they are doing? Or are we just at a place where everyone has some good, some bad, and we kind of have to look across the gambit and just take the best of each one to figure out what, what will work nationally? Yeah, so first, just point of clarification that we're not international just yet. Sorry. We have ambitions to get international. It depends how long it takes me to post this interview. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're not there yet, but we have looked at a lot of markets um, outside of the US. But, you know, just because of the nature of what we do, Todd, it just it takes so much time. Like, I think we're in 28 states right now where we cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, those states are on the legal, uh, the regulation side. So, it, you know, as you can imagine, every state has their regs. Then you have the local municipalities, and depending on the size of the state, you know, there's a lot of coverage there in itself. So we're a little bit more of a slow-moving train when it comes to coverage. But you know, I, I, I don't want to say one state. I mean, there are certain states that certainly clearly do it very, very well, and I think they what they do is they model it after kind of the all kind of legacy states, right? So you have the Colorados, the Washingtons, et cetera, and, uh, California even, and some states certainly do it better versus others. But I think over time, you're gonna see, uh, there will be some level of standard that comes out of it because you know, there's now history, right? Yeah. You know, when we first started, everyone was just trying to figure it out. But um, I, I, I certainly don't wanna tick off any state, you know, uh, in particular, but I, I would just say that uh, some do it better than others right now, but I, I think it'll, it'll get more standardized as we go. Curious to know. Try to be diplomatic in that answer. No, no, that's fine. Trust me. Um, I'm curious to know, though, because, you know, a company like you has so much information on the compliance and the historical information and, and especially how companies are operating within those confines. Do you get, do they knock on your door for assistance for policymaking at all? I mean, has, has anyone reached out to you guys for help? So what we, I think the guys at Vicente Cedarburg um, get hit up quite a bit because, you know, we're not a law firm. Yeah. We don't really go and even offer up any sort of guidance on policymaking. Although I will say internationally, you know, there's a lot of countries, including so I'm from a little island called Sri Lanka. You know, even Sri Lanka, which is a very conservative Buddhist country, is now um, you know trying to head towards legalization. And you know, you do hear people do reach out from some of these other countries every once in a while, just because of the nature of what we do. But for the most part, I think you know, for policymaking, countries and or states, uh, they have smart people and you know groups like Vicente Cedarberg and others that help them with that. But we we shy away from that because we're not, even though we have a lot of lawyers internally within the company, we are like, hey, we're we're an end result product, not so much on the early side. 
Very cool, man. Well, I mean, listen, if it were me, I just feel like you guys have all this great information. It would be a wealth of knowledge. But like you said, the lawyers actually know how to to scan through that and, and figure out how to put it in policy. I guess I guess that's what they went to school for. Marion, I, I could talk to you for the rest of the day, but I do have a day job to do. So we're going to have to get to the end of this interview here. I told you that, no, you know. Isn't. I'm working on Ricky's new brand. You know, if he sees me on TV too much, he might get angry. But, you know, before I let you go, looking at the end of this year, we've got hopefully the conferences will stay on the calendar. Those will be back. 2022 should be huge for us. What What are you looking forward to for both, you know, Simplify and the industry this year and next? Well, obviously, you know, there's a lot of kind of key uh, legislative stuff that's on the horizon, right, from safe banking to obviously legalization coming around and, I'm, I'm just excited to see, you know, now with COVID, even though it's kind of up and down, I'm excited for, you know, Vegas, where so much of the industry folks come together. Uh, hopefully I'll see you there as well, Todd. Oh, but, I will be there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's more immediate, more on the fun side. But I, th I think for the industry as a whole, I'm, I'm excited to see more of the black market uh, folks coming on to the legal side. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for, uh, you know, for things, taxes, that type of nature to also get easier for the industry. And, uh, you know, look, there's a lot of people coming in. There's a lot of new entrants. And I am hopeful that uh, we're going to get to this point where this industry is absolutely, you know, able to run like any other business. And I think that's the real the disadvantage we still have. You know, even banking, we talk about it all the time. It's, it's still not very easy, right? And yeah. the taxes and the write-offs and there, it, I'm sometimes surprised that this industry has moved as fast as we have, right? Because there's so much against them. And I'm just really proud, I think, for the industry as a whole and where we have come to. Um, and you know, that's kind of what I'm looking for. And I'm looking forward to our, our payment solution getting out there and, and hopefully making a big difference as well. Uh, just, I think I think that speaks back to what we talked about at the beginning of the, the interview when we opened up saying that you know, in the cannabis space, we don't just smoke weed all day. We, <laughs> right. sorry, we don't just smoke weed all day. You know, hats off to the entrepreneurs in this industry because they have, not only do they have to deal with the challenges that a traditional entrepreneur has to deal with, but there are so many other roadblocks in their way that yeah. don't allow them to use modern business technologies, just down to the advertising or the way how many cannabis companies are losing their Instagram and everything else, right? With, yeah. by, by doing nothing different than they've done historically and, and staying within yeah. the rules. It's just these platforms are deplatforming them. People are getting shadow banned yeah. and you've got to figure out ways around all of this. So, you know, taking it full circle, I think what you said, showing how this industry has advanced so quickly with all the weights tied to it, that that is just that proves to show you that the entrepreneurs in this industry, you know, we I'd put them up against any other industry in, in, as far as knowledge and ability and, and drive and passion. Absolutely, man. I, I think it's, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm stunned even today to see how far we've progressed. And I think, you know, the next few years are going to be a lot of rapid changes, especially when legalization hopefully comes around. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of people coming in to gobble up these companies as well. So, you know, I, I think we just need to buckle down and be ready for what's about to come. But, you know, hats off to everyone else. Just like you said, I think it's pretty cool. Well, very cool. Before I let you go, is there anything you'd want to promote anywhere you want to send people, websites, any of that stuff? No, so, you know, anyone that's interested, obviously, in uh, in hearing more or learning more about Simplify, just go to www.simplifya, S-I-M-P-L-I-F-Y-A.com. Um, and our payments product that's coming out is called Tender, T-E-N-D-R. Uh, it's, you know, payments, commerce, and a whole host of kind of cool stuff that really, um, I think, is going to make a difference. And, you know, we're going in partnering with POS first, and we'll branch out after that but uh yeah i really appreciate you taking the time Todd. it's nice to see you again you've come a long way from when we were first chatting with you back in the day so you know super happy for you and i love your energy dude you you bring a nice easy way of you know conversation i think so you have a good knack for that thank you man i very much appreciate that i love doing this show it i get to talk to people like you all the time it makes it super easy on me and yeah, yeah man we'll we will do this again sometime Thanks, Dad. Nice to be on here.
Absolutely. And thank you to everybody at home for watching. I am done with the marathon week of shows. I'm going to get somebody else to handle my calendar because I clearly suck at it. Thank you again to our sponsor, Contempo Specialty Packaging. And of course, if you missed any part of this excellent conversation, you know, I really got to rethink that one because if you missed any part of it, oh, maybe you came in late. I was going to say, you probably didn't stay till this part, but you can check it out on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. And uh, next week, I screwed that one up. It'll be on our YouTube page next week. Please comment, like, and subscribe uh, probably around Wednesday or Friday of next week. Of course, if you don't want to watch the video, you can check it out on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else that you get your podcast, folks. This has been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We're done for the week, and I will see you guys on Wednesday. Take care.